Still with us, appellate and trial attorney Matthew Barhoma. Obviously, obviously so heartbreaking um, what these families have had to endure. And, you know, I, I get emotional just listening to them. And it's understandable. They want him to, they don't want him to live. They want the death penalty. That's what prosecutors are seeking in this penalty phase. Obviously, the defense wants, uh, wants Cruz to serve life sentences, 17 life sentences for his crimes. Um, what is the, the penalty phase going to look like in terms of what, what we're going to see? Well, I mean, look at the timeline set by this court, Joy. You could tell a whole lot about what's coming, right? That's a lengthy timeline. And, you know, I think jury selection is going to be excruciating. There's, It's going to be hard to find an impartial jury, especially in a death case. So ultimately, you know, um, th this is going to be a long period. And what we just saw, these victim impact statements of sorts, are, are only the beginning. Um, you know, they're going to be pouring in. There's 17 dead. That means there's two parents for each at least the minimum um, if they're around and that means that there's a lot of people impacted here sure and um, you know I was actually in, in the courtroom when Cruz you know made made some of those statements apologizing to to the families which certainly they you heard what they said about that they didn't want to hear from him at all there's nothing that he could say that can change what he did is what they said nevertheless how important is that for a jury yeah, you know, remorse is very important. Um, showing remorse is very important. I actually represent defendants all the time during sentencing and resentencing. And expressing remorse is a very, very, very important aspect uh, because it shows the level of retribution needed. It shows the level of how much, um, you know, he's sincere. Now, to victims, almost always, inevitably, and you heard it, um, it sounds like it's a slap in the face. Mm. Um, and and that, that's really what it, it sounds like. It sounds like he's saying sorry, but sorry for what? The, these are 17 individuals we can never get back. Yeah, 100%. Um, you know, on, on a related note, earlier this week, the Department of Justice, they paid a huge settlement with um, some of the, the victims' families, actually $127.5 million dollars paid out here. The basis of this is that the, the victim's families claim that there was an FBI agent who received several tips that Cruz was about to do this and yet did not intervene. Um, so the DOJ didn't admit any, any fault here, but they did pay out the settlement. Uh, what, what do you think this means in relation to everything else that we're, what's the significance, I should say, in, in relation to everything else we're seeing with this case? Well, I mean, to some extent, it could have been stopped. It wasn't. Um, there is still people that are dead out of it, right? So uh, it's an unfortunate, you know, incident. Uh, now, I think the fact that it could have been stopped is actually going to probably play a worse hand with the jury. They're going to see that and, and see the gratitude of what was about to come, how bad it was. It made its way to the FBI, and it's still impeded nonetheless. So I don't think that's going to help him. I think that's going to hurt him. Yeah, interestingly enough, you know, uh, Cruz said that he wanted not the jury to decide his sentence. He wanted the victim's families to do so. Um, actually, let's go ahead and let our, our viewers listen to that. What I meant was that um, I believe they should have the right to uh, choose the mm -hmm. victims themselves on whether uh, I should take uh, life or death. So in other words, you're urging the victims to encourage the state to waive it and no. sentence you to life. Judge, may I interject? Sure. I think what Mr. Um, Cruz was saying was that ultimately in his heart, he believes it should be the victim's families that okay. make the decision about life or death. We have, however, explained to Mr. Cruz that it will in fact be the jury that will make that decision after the presentation of evidence of aggravators and mitigators in phase two. Okay. This, I believe, is just his personal belief. I understand. It is in conflict with the law, but he understands the law. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Cruz, is that correct? Yes. So, so if you were the legislature, you would leave it up to the victims to decide what penalty to impose, but you understand that's not the state of the law in Florida. Yes, I understand it's, that. You understand it's going to be up to the jury. I understand that. Okay. Uh, hearing that, what's your reaction? 
Yeah, I, I think this is someone who really has a lot of mental issues to deal with. But, um, you know, listen, leaving it up to the victims is, is obviously a great gratuitous act from him. Um, not the way that the law works. There's this penalty phase for a reason. Um, and uh, the, the laws around this, special circumstance doctrine and mitigating factors or aggravating factors, these are long uh, held principles of law that we that we follow, especially in death cases. And I think that the court's going to have to owe him this due process nonetheless. Mm, well, and certainly, you know, when you're talking about mitigating and aggravating factors, we heard just here in, in the guilt phase and where he, um, well, there wasn't really a guilt phase, he, he pleaded guilty. He, he described, I guess, what could amount to uh, mitigating factors when it comes to the penalty phase. He talked about uh, drug use. He talked about how he essentially thought drugs were ruining the country and were leading people to commit violent acts, including himself is what it sounded like he was implying. Um, so when you talk about the drug use and then you're looking at potential mental health issues, uh, how strong are those in terms of mitigating uh, these circumstances? They're, they're huge. Um, they're huge. They're on his legal team to bring up. And, um, you know, I would have hoped that they would have brought him up by now. Um, it seems like this is moving forward. No mental issues. And um, he's going to face the outcome of this um, at the end of this, uh, whether it be life or death. I wonder also if his age at the time uh, plays, plays a role in this, do you think? Absolutely, 100%. If he was under the age of 18, um, that, that would be one factor. But if he was over the age of 18, that's a whole other factor to consider. And under the age of 26, there is actually a pretty beefed up criteria here, Joy. Oh, yeah. Very, very interesting points. In terms of the aggravating factors, we were listening to the victims' families talk about just having to sit there in court and hear, you know, how many times uh, this victim was shot, how many times this victim was shot. I mean, that that's really brutal to have to sit through that. Uh, but when it comes to just the letter of the law for aggravating, aggravating factors, what is the jury going to consider? Well, um, the level of planning that he went through, the level of consciousness of guilt that he had, um, the amount of people that he may have um, killed, how long it lasted, whether any of them were tortured or not, all of these are all aggravating factors. They're all factors that are going to go towards him getting death versus life. Um, age and other aspects and maybe things in his personal background, um, you could provide as mitigating factors and you could appoint experts to be able to pull these things out um, in a report. So there, there, it goes both ways really for, for someone like him.